Welcome to How I Built My Fundraising Consultancy, the stories behind the people driving results in the nonprofit sector. To anyone who is thinking about consulting or is dipping their toe in, this is such an important area to talk about. When you start out as a consultant, you basically want to take any project that comes your way, and in fact, you may have to, to get the revenue that you need. But as time goes on, you really start to understand, one, you don't have to take every client, and two, every client is not necessarily a fit for your skills or temperament anyway. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. Today in the podcast is Sarah Jackson. Sarah is the president of Sarah J Consulting, found at sarahjconsulting.com. SJC has been in operation since January of 2012 and is based in the Boston area. Prior to starting her own business, Sarah worked at a variety of nonprofits in the Boston area and has a BA in communications from Manual College. Without further delay, here's my interview with Sarah. I'm here today with Sarah Jackson. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Tim. Thanks for joining me today. First off, can you introduce yourself and your consultancy? Sure. So my name is Sarah Jackson, and my consultancy is Sarah J Consulting, also known as SJC. We've been in existence for about six years now, which is just hard to believe. I feel like we just started yesterday. We do a variety of really fun and interesting services for mission-driven organizations. The three buckets we like to talk about our fundraising strategy, fundraising communication and messaging, and coaching. And this can take a variety of forms, everything from campaign planning, campaign writing, to major gifts help, to foundation and corporate relations, to a more holistic view of a, a development department and assessing operations. So we really get to take that nice 30,000 foot view with some clients and with other clients, we drill down to a specific prospect, a specific project, So the variety is really great, and we're happy that so far over these past six years, we've gotten to work with more than 30 clients. And how do you get started with a new client? Oftentimes, we will do an intake meeting or an intake call to talk about their pressure points. And certainly, most of the time when a potential client contacts me, it's because they already have a pretty good sense of the particular area that they need help with. What's really neat is when we really start digging in with a client, we often will find that there might be more pressure points associated with the initial reason why they called us and we can help with those. So for example, if it's, gee, we really need to improve our fundraising, help us find more prospects, we might also in that process discover that maybe they need help refining their messaging. Why do they need money? Why should people care about this nonprofit? It's really fun to get to peel back those layers with the client and do whatever we can to help them be successful. Gotcha. Now, when you first started SJC, Were those three things in place from the get-go, strategy, donor communication, and coaching, or is this something you've developed over the years? Uh, That's a great question. Um, (laughs) These three things have developed over time. I think it would be absolutely incredible if someone launched a fundraising consultancy and immediately had their business plan and their three things or their whole suite of services like refined out of the gate. Certainly my experience and in speaking with other consultants, it's something that evolves and changes both as you as a professional and a person grow and as you get to know your clients and as frankly you get to know yourself and what your real strengths and weaknesses are. So these three things have evolved and they used to be called different things and I'm sure I actually have no doubt they will continue to evolve. But for now, these are the three, I guess you can call it the nomenclature that we use to try to describe the many things that we do. Gotcha. And how did you get started with the business? Uh, Did you work with nonprofits prior to your own consultancy? I did, yes. So for about a decade, I worked in really wonderful development offices at large institutions in Boston. So I worked at Brigham and Women's Hospital I worked at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Jimmy Fund, and I worked at Harvard University. And at these places, I feel like so much of it was preparation and an apprenticeship for this consultancy that 
I didn't even know back in 2001 when I entered the workforce that it would be something I would ultimately do. But I feel very grateful that I had all that experience and was able to bring those skills and learnings and contacts and knowledge to bear on my clients today. And you mentioned in those 10 years, you worked at both a university and in healthcare. How are those two sectors different and how are they the same? Yeah. So they are very similar in the sense that these particular institutions are all Harvard or Harvard affiliated. So there's that piece of it. They're large. They have lots of moving parts, lots of political considerations internally, lots of different departments and and processes established. The difference, though, culturally, I would say, is in the hospital setting, you can imagine because literally the business, if you will, is life and death, caring for thousands of patients every day, the pace of the work is similar. So everything has a similar sense of urgency. And even with my healthcare and hospital clients today, I find that same sense of urgency. If a proposal needs to be written for a donor or a report needs to be done or a briefing, there's always that sense of urgency. At a university, the work is still very important and serious, though I do sense culturally that it feels a little bit less urgent Not to say deadlines aren't typically urgent and things like that, but there's just a different feeling. There's almost more space to breathe. There's almost more space to think and take a minute. So it's fascinating to me how the fundraising needs really mirror the culture of what these organizations do at their core. Yeah. Now, I was looking through your website and it looks like you're now built the business to where you have a team of five people, including yourself. How did this team develop? And is it just you on day one? It sure was. It was just me. Now it's it's five. The beauty, though, of this team, and I tried to explain this a little bit on my website, they're more like collaborators. So as a small business, I'm not ready yet at this phase in my business to take on permanent full-time employees under what, what you would consider a W-2 form. So really what I do is I have these wonderful colleagues who I've known forever, who I trust totally implicitly, who are just excellent specialists at what they do in development and nonprofit work. And I bring them in on subcontract as needed. So from a business standpoint, rather than having to keep them on as an employee with benefits in a W-2, I can bring them on as a contractor on a 1099 form. And that works out really well for everyone because If they're interested in the project and there's a fit and they want to do it, great. If there's not a need for that person, that's fine too. So it's nice flexibility for all of us. Gotcha. So your role in this team is kind of heading up all the projects and making sure the resources are there to accomplish all the projects ahead. That's right. Although I'm also, I would say, still very much in the mix with every project. So And this might be something I consider as I evolve and if I do take on permanent staff at some point to start delegating out more of. Even if I'm using a subcontractor for a writing project, I'm still the final eyes and ears. I'm still in contact with the client. So I'm managing the whole business and all the projects, but I'm also still doing a lot of the work as well, along with my colleagues when I bring them in. I actually enjoy the variety. It's a nice challenge. One of your three pillars is donor communication. Where do you find that most organizations need help with? It really depends on the nonprofit, but there are a couple of areas that tend to pop up again and again. One of them is creating tailored proposals for prospective donors to consider making a large gift, whether that be grant application to a foundation or a proposal to a major gift individual donor, the proposal area is huge. And it's an area that I I help clients quite a bit with. The other area, which can be a little more subtle, but very, very important, is the core messaging of the organization. When we are talking to potential donors about fundraising, it's so important to tell them Why does this nonprofit exist? At the end of the day, what is this nonprofit doing that is making such a difference? And why should your dollars be put with this nonprofit in particular? In that vein, we spend quite a bit of time working on what I call core messaging. 
who are you? Why do you exist? And from there, we build out to specific programs, specific goals and objectives. So the proposal is the most narrow area. It's really homing in on a specific project or initiative. And then on the opposite spectrum, we have this whole sort of more esoteric, why do you exist in the first place? And those two ends of the spectrum are really interesting to get to write about, and they're equally important to have. Gotcha. Now, jumping to strategy, I think Major Gifts was mentioned on your website. Where do organizations fail when it comes to Major Gifts strategy? I don't know that it's failing so much as for any organization, which are all just so individual and so different. The question is really, where are the gaps? In some organizations, it may be that the gap is simply, gosh, we have a whole lot of really wonderful major gifts prospects, and we just don't know or don't have the bandwidth to write really strong tailored proposals that match their particular interests. In the cases of other nonprofits, it's, gosh, we have never built a major gifts program before, and we don't know where to begin can you help us? So SJC really gets to help again with both sides of that. And again, it's quite tailored to the needs of the particular nonprofit. Gotcha. For coaching, what's that look like for your consultancy to come in and help with coaching? Coaching can take on very literal and subtle forms. What I mean by that is, in the literal sense, coaching is workshops, presenting, public speaking, which frankly, I have not done too much of by design. Although I enjoy public speaking and I enjoy sharing what I know, that hasn't been a revenue generator for me per se. The more subtle element is when we go in with a client on a strategy contract or a writing contract, we do often find that we end up providing some insights, some learnings, additional knowledge on a day-to-day basis, just in the course of conversations with our clients. That type of coaching is something we do a lot of and something that I really enjoy. That one-on-one, let me share what I know and see how we can help you move the needle. Gotcha. Now, going back to the very beginning of your business, how did you find that first client? I found that first client by reaching out to my network of wonderful colleagues. And basically, while I was still at my last full-time job, which was Harvard, I started asking people to grab lunch and coffee with me and ran this idea by them. And I basically sat down and said, I may be crazy, but here's what I'm thinking for a nonprofit consulting business. Is that so far afield or what do you think? And a couple of them said, not only does it sound pretty appropriate, but we actually need some help. So I was able to start by doing some very small side projects for clients in that way. And then six months later, it was moving along well enough that I could leave my job at Harvard and do this full time. And what's it look like now when you are marketing your business and finding new clients? It's not totally dissimilar from how I started. (laughs) Still very much the same. I feel fortunate that by continuing to stay in touch with former clients, with colleagues, with peers, I'm able to maintain a really nice pipeline of clients and potential clients. So I really enjoy networking. For me personally, it's more, though, about the individual people as opposed to going to a conference and networking. Fundraising and nonprofit work is all about relationships. That really mirrors how I continue to get my work is by these wonderful, rich relationships that I have with colleagues. And as a result of that, have you found that most of your business is still kind of in the Boston area? Yes, it is. It's in the Boston area. And The longer I am in business, I'm also finding a nice expansion in the North Shore of Massachusetts where I live. I actually live and have an office in Lynn, Mass, and have been becoming more involved on the North Shore in a variety of ways. So as a result, I have some clients here as well and in New York. So there have been wonderful colleagues of mine who have moved to New York City to take on new fundraising jobs there. 
And they've been kind enough to call me and have me do some work in New York. It's all rooted in Boston, but slowly but surely expanding, which is very cool. Gotcha. So you mentioned you live up in Massachusetts and you probably work out of a home office. How much of the work is spent at that office versus at the client's location? So I actually rent an office in downtown Lynn. I found about nine months into my consultancy that I needed to get out of the house. (laughs) (laughs) It was really fun for a while to like work out of a cafe, work out of my living room. But the whole concept of a self-employed person sitting in their pajamas on the couch all day just isn't really the truth for me. So I come to an office every day in downtown Lynn. I find that the majority of my work happens in my office, particularly with the writing clients. We do a lot virtually. We do a lot on the phone. Certainly for my New York clients, I think I've met two of them in person. The rest of the colleagues at this one particular hospital in New York, I only have ever known on the phone, but I feel like I know them quite well because we've been working together for five years. It's kind of nice that I don't have to travel a whole bunch. Yeah. Now, what makes an ideal client for you? And you have you ever had to turn down business or stop working with the client just because it wasn't working out? Yes. And honestly, to anyone who is thinking about consulting or is dipping their toe in, this is such an important area to talk about. When you start out as a consultant, you basically want to take any project that comes your way. And in fact, you may have to, to get the revenue that you need. But as time goes on, you really start to understand, one, you don't have to take every client. And two, every client is not necessarily a fit for your skills or temperament anyway. There have been situations where I've had to turn down work either because I was just too busy or because I just had that instinct, that red flag that went up that in the course of talking with them, it just seemed like it maybe was not going to be a right fit. And again, Just like many things in life, there's the element of, do we fit on a personal level? Do our personalities, our temperaments match? And then do the skills fit for the project? I do find that clients who I really enjoy working with, our clients really understand the value of fundraising, who really understand the value of bringing an expert in to assist and understand that it's a partnership that fundraising can't just be a consultant coming in and doing the work for them. It's people who really roll up their sleeves with me and say, okay, we're a team, let's do this. And I love it when I can work with a client who makes me feel like I'm part of the team. That to me is the perfect situation. Yeah, where you're not an outsider anymore. Exactly. I can come to the table and we can just have really candid conversations about what's working at the nonprofit, what isn't, and talk about it together and bandy ideas back and forth and help with the implementation. Have you ever run across a situation where you weren't greeted that way and it almost felt like the fundraisers there were kind of threatened by having to work with the consultant? Yes, just one or two where the actual people in the fundraising roles maybe felt a little threatened. And in that case, and in all cases, but especially in that case, I really work hard to build a rapport that is trusting, that is open. I have really learned that vulnerability and honesty go so far with every client, particularly where people might feel threatened or worried or concerned that who is this person to come in and kind of upend everything, which is certainly not what we want to do. We try to build that openness with folks and just go from there. In most cases, and I've learned this over the years, I have a good sense prior to signing the contract, whether or not that's going to be the case. I'm at the point in my consultancy where if I feel like the organization maybe really isn't fully on board with the fundraising consultant, you know, maybe a trustee is saying you need to hire a consultant or maybe they're getting pressure from elsewhere to do it. But the people I would be working with are just not feeling it. That's not a job that I want to take. I don't want people to hire me to check off a box. I want people to hire me they're excited, they feel good, they're not threatened, they know that I'm here to be a support, etc. So I'm looking for the positive opportunities. Certainly challenging opportunities are not scary. It's more about what's the composition of the team 
And is a consultant welcome? Because if they're not, then don't even bother. It's not right. Yeah. Time. <laughs> Looking back at the very beginning, were there any mistakes that you learned from that? If you were doing it all over again, you do it differently? Yes, 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 absolutely. <laughs> I think when you're going through any kind of a failure or a mistake, you feel inadequate, you feel embarrassed, you feel like, what am I doing? Why am I a consultant? But ultimately, it helps you grow and become stronger. And actually, I spend a fair amount of time happily speaking with other consultants who are maybe newer to the work, maybe so they can avoid some of the mistakes I've made. I think it includes, as I've mentioned previously, making sure that I'm working with the right client, that I am a good fit for them and that they are a good fit for me, which I think a lot of people tend to forget that second part because we're so worried about, am I going to have any kind of a paycheck this month? So it's that. And it's also the business side of things like what does a, a good contract look like? What does a good rate look like? And a lot of that is trial and error and just evolving as you go. I'm certain there have been other mistakes or opportunities to learn that I've had, but those two really stick out in my mind. Gotcha. Now, have you over the years tried out virtual assistants or things on Upwork or ways to get work done that you just don't want to deal with or have time to deal with? Yes. So for several months, I used a wonderful small virtual assistant firm based out of Michigan called Longer Days. They were great. My assistant, Colton, was wonderful. And after several months, though, I realized that while he was doing a wonderful job, it got to the point where I realized that I might be able to find someone local who I could interface with and kind of train more on a much more tailored level than what's available for a virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. And so I ultimately found someone local who I absolutely adore to work with me in that capacity. But I found that the VA option was a great stepping stone for me to be able to say, okay, yes, I can find someone to do this administrative work for me. And yes, I can delegate and let go of certain tasks. Yeah. And what kind of tasks do you delegate? You mean administrative work. What does that entail? So the work entails quite a bit of social media, posting for me, finding interesting websites and things to put out there for me. It includes some project management. So the person I work with, Carla Sherry, who is available, actually, she runs her own project management business called Kick It Up Consulting. She also helped me to implement Smartsheet, which is a wonderful project management tool that we now use and we check in weekly. It keeps me honest and on task with all of my projects. She also does some writing for me and assists on occasion with scheduling and with some client communication. So she's just been completely invaluable to my work. Gotcha. And last question before the lightning round, what's your typical schedule like? I don't know that there's a typical schedule. It tends to be trying to balance a lot of phone calls. So, you know, as I mentioned, the majority of my meetings are virtual. So a lot of phone meetings or in-person meetings when necessary with carving out quiet, dedicated time to actually do the writing, actually do the work. And then, of course, finding a little bit of time in between there for some marketing and some networking. It really varies day to day, but... I would say a lot of my week is spent speaking with clients and then trying to balance that with the actual work itself. When we return a quick lightning round, first, a quick break. This episode of How I Built My Fundraising Consultancy is brought to you by us here at MarketSmart and the Fundraising Report Card. Expand your fundraising consultancy toolkit by signing up for fundraisingreportcard.com. What is the Fundraising Report Card? Well, it's a free service offered at fundraisingreportcard.com that enhances your business with easy-to-use fundraising analytics and charts. Help your clients get proposals approved faster by using the beautiful and elegant charts created automatically in seconds by fundraisingreportcard.com. Best of all, you can use your logo in the reports and charts it generates. Learn more about the consultant version of Fundraising Report Card at www.fundraisingreportcard.com slash consultants. Available as a free version or a paid version billed quarterly or annually. Once again, that's fundraisingreportcard.com slash consultants. Now, back to how I built my fundraising consultancy. 
So with that, let's get to the lightning round. Just a series of quick questions and answers. Okay. What's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? To be true to yourself, your own brand, and to get really specific about what it is that you are selling. That will bring you the best success. And what book would you recommend to those getting started and why? There is a great book that a friend gave me called Getting Naked, and it's all about this concept of starting a consulting business, being vulnerable, being honest, building the business. It's just a great sort of hard and soft skill book, and it's an easy read. What's your favorite personal productivity habit? I don't know if it's productive, but it's cleaning out my Gmail (laughs) down to like every email has been read and replied. What's the best under $100 purchase you've made in the last month or so? extra chargers for my Fitbit because I lost my Fitbit charger and I was bummed that I couldn't count my steps. It may not seem work related, but I think getting steps and kind of taking the time has been so helpful for me to clear my head and start the day right. So Fitbit, I love it. What's your favorite monthly service or subscription you're signed up for? My Wix account. I love Wix. My website is based in Wix. I also send a very short micro monthly e-newsletter out and Wix calls it a shout out. And I've gotten so many compliments on the design and the format of it. And that's all thanks to Wix. What's an interesting or fun fact about you that most people don't know? I used to do a lot of theater singing and acting. Most people, especially my clients, probably don't know that about me. Desk or car, what would you clean first? Desk, always the desk. And tea or coffee? Coffee, always. What do clients never ask you that you wish they did? Do you have time to do this, Sarah? (laughs) (laughs) What is the most common error you see nonprofits make? Listening, listening to their donors, their constituents. Often, I think from a fundraising perspective, we feel as nonprofits that we need to be talking and sharing and posting and discussing when really what we need to be doing is listening absorbing, acknowledging, and responding with appropriate content and giving opportunities that match each individual's interests. What charities do you admire or support? So many. One charity in particular, because full disclosure, my husband runs it, but it's just such a beautiful nonprofit, is Citizens Inn in Peabody. Citizens Inn is a recent merger of two nonprofits, one that has dealt with homelessness and support for families and mothers and kids, and one that has dealt with hunger. These two organizations recently came together to form Citizens Inn, and it's just such important daily work. The fact that a child might go a whole day without eating or that a mom cannot get the help she needs to get her child to school. The fact that people who live paycheck to paycheck may suddenly experience a health issue or their car breaks down and now they don't have money to eat. So all of these things are just so vital to who we are as humans. And I'm very impressed to see this organization growing and expanding. Yeah. And where can people find more information about your services? People can go to Sarah J Consulting, S A R A H J Consulting.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Sarah, so much for your time today. It's been great chatting with you. You as well. I really appreciate it. Thanks for what you're doing, too. Thanks for listening to this episode of How I Built My Fundraising Consultancy, presented by Market Smart. If you like the show, make sure to review it in Apple Podcasts and pass it along to a colleague. If you're curious about what we do, go to imarketsmart.com and don't forget to check out the consultant's version of Fundraising Report Card found at www.fundraisingreportcard.com slash consultants. Thanks for listening.